Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Susan James, Library Manager here at Bayless and Assistant Director of the Superior District Library. I want to thank Joe Haskey for coming tonight, <coughs> the Friends of the Library for Refreshments, which I hope you'll enjoy, the Library's Program Committee, Nancy Gillette, who's here tonight, Maggie Johnson, Debbie Lehman, and Ashley Bergeron. Joe Haskey was born in Sault Ste. Marie and is a graduate of Cedarville High School. He earned a BA in English at Lake Superior State University before earning graduate degrees at Bowling Green University and the University of Texas Pan American. He currently teaches at South Texas College in McAllen, Texas. Three years ago, he was awarded the 2011 Boulevard Emerging Fiction Writer Award. His fiction and poetry have been featured in numerous publications, as well as anthologies such as The Way North, Collected Upper Peninsula New Works, and New, New Border Voices. Tonight, he'll speak about his debut novel, North Dixie Highway, that is set primarily in the Eastern UP. Copies of this novel are available for signing and purchase after his death. Please welcome Joseph Paskey. It's really great to be here in the city that I was born in to uh, <laughs> talk a little bit about my book. And uh, great to see family and old friends and new friends. and. Um, I did attend Lake Superior, and Eric Gazinski, who's here tonight, was a mentor of mine and largely responsible for me writing and, and teaching, and so if you don't like it, you can maybe blame him too. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good to see, uh, it, it, a couple of, uh, maybe it was a year ago or two years ago that I found out that uh, Mr. Doug Hegley, who was here tonight, is an editor of uh, Boulevard, which you know for me, is a journal that I love. Uh, obviously, I'm biased, right, but uh, you know, pretty amazing, and a lot of... Uh, Pulitzer Prize winning writers share my opinion, and, and uh, <laughs> he is um, one of the best editors in the country, and uh, if I were the people working at Lake Superior, I might try to find some employment if he's willing to uh, work with you. <laughs> he's an excellent uh, editor, and you know, I was trying to decide what I wanted to read tonight, and there are a few different things that might be good. Uh, you know, one is actually set almost entirely in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, but there's another piece that um, was published in Boulevard, and Mr. Hegley actually was uh, the one who helped uh, get it in reading shape, right? So maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll read that one, the one called Smell. But before I get started with that, um, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about the book for those who haven't read it. I know a few of you have, but maybe others haven't. Uh, basically, you know, we, we call it a novel. It's not a Victorian style linear type of novel, if that's what you're looking for. It is, in some ways, kind of blurring genres, right? It's maybe not unlike a story cycle, but it's maybe more like a novel than a story cycle, and everything is really closely related. But it, um, the beginning might be kind of confusing because uh, we're looking at different uh, times, right? We start off in the present of uh, the mid-90s, and we go back to the childhood of the protagonist, and we also see some scenes, some very brief scenes from the military experience of this uh, narrator. And it's maybe kind of confusing in the beginning, but hopefully the plan was that it sort of falls together as you read along. And I wanted the reader to be somewhat disoriented when they started out, to sort of feel what this character was feeling. You know, maybe some of the, the PTSD and other stress that came from uh, traumatic childhood events in this time during war and, and uh, so it, it's hard to get uh, the big picture just with one excerpt, you know, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. It, it, when I read the, the Smelt story, that's about, um, it, it, it's set in the childhood period of the narrator. And I set out to write a book that was set primarily in the Eastern Upper Peninsula. And it does travel to different places. And if you're not uh, sure why I would call a book like that Northern Dixie Highway, <laughs> I was trying to come up with some sort of interesting uh, place name that might be symbolic of not only the, the area, but also the story that I wanted to tell. And when I was researching, and I didn't do a whole lot of research for the book, you know, because that's hard work for creative people. You know, we like to just <laughs> do it on the fly, right? But uh, I was looking into the, the history of uh, the Eastern Upper Peninsula, and I saw that an inter interesting fact was that it was the northmost end of the Dixie Highway, and if you know anything about that highway system, 
It uh, is spread out all across the eastern United States. It goes down as far south as Miami and um, into other states, Mississippi, uh, you know, Georgia, North Carolina, all the way up through to Chicago and the eastern upper peninsula and you know, through the state of Michigan, the states of Ohio, Kentucky, you know, all over the place, right? And this was the northmost end. What's happened uh, in the last century or so, right, is that a lot of these stretches of the highway have been covered up and we have modern highways that have taken the place of the Dixie Highway. And here in the eastern upper peninsula, I believe from my research, it told me that US-2 and part of M129 now constitute what the old Dixie Highway was. And if you do go to uh, southern Michigan, you'll still find stretches of highway, like you were saying, that are uh, designated as Dixie Highway. And I saw them in Ohio too, and I would see them in Georgia and every place that I would travel around the country. And I thought it was sort of uh, a fitting uh, symbol for the, like I said, the story I wanted to tell. And so I ended up using that as the title. And for people who are interested in history, pure history of the Dixie Highway, you're gonna be disappointed if you read it there. It's only part of the backdrop of the story, you know, sort of a, um, a way to set up the story and, and to uh, bring a little history in. Um, I guess a friend of mine uh, was reading it on a, on a flight to uh, Boston or someplace and someone was interested in the book because they saw that the, the title was North Dixie Highway and they thought it was a history of the highway and and then <laughs> when my friend explained what the book was about he seemed really disappointed I guess. <laughs> but uh, I have since I've written it uh, met a few people who are Dixie Highway enthusiasts and they informed me that I think that starting this year and next year there are all sorts of uh, uh, celebratory uh, plans for the 100th anniversary of the Dixie, Dixie Highway, so it might have been good planning, and I didn't even, uh, it was just dumb luck that I happened to choose that. Um, but, you know, I wanted to write a book also that was, uh, you know, not only set in the Eastern Upper Peninsula, but something that, uh, you know, maybe would convey a, a, uh, an understanding of fictional history and, and uh, you know, be literary on some level, you know, but at the same time, I wanted it to be the kind of story that maybe uh, just your average reader could read and take something from it and, and maybe enjoy it. And if I achieve this, I don't, I don't know for sure, but you know, hopefully. And, um, and maybe I could uh, read a little bit and then talk more afterward. And if you have questions, we can do a Q&A afterward. And a lot of these readings, I was telling the, the people in Detour last night that I spent probably the first half hour just explaining uh, what a Uber is or what the, the uh, life is like in the Eastern Upper Peninsula. And <laughs> you don't have to do that for us. No. <laughs> so I changed my game plan. But uh, let's see if I can find this one. But, uh, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, as I was putting together some of the different uh, chapters and stories, right, that, that constitute the book uh, of some of the things that really define life in the Eastern Upper Peninsula. And I didn't want to be, you know, too cliche and, and do the, the deer hunting story and, and that sort of thing, right, because I think it's been done too many times. I tried to find more interesting things that would be unique to the region. And one thing that came to mind was the smelt fishing, the smelt dipping that occurs in the spring every year. You know, because <laughs> in very few parts of the country do people know what a smelt is. I, I heard that in California that there are places where people do it too. But it must be a different type of smelt. But, uh, and I was also thinking as I was writing this about how when I was a kid, um, you know, you'd go out there and it'd be so plentiful, you know, and, and then these days there are a lot fewer smelt than there used to be. And so I thought that was a thing metaphor too for some of the other themes I was trying to touch on in the in the book but I'll shut up and, and read it in it. <laughs> Since my baby cousins are here too I'll, if, if anything is too strong I might uh, change it slightly. But there is some you know cursing and bad behavior so I hope that I don't offend anyone. But. <laughs> in mid-April the bank that leads up the up to the mouth of the of the Carp River is a five mile stretch of Shantytown. Whiskey and beer bottles everywhere, the carp curves and cuts its way through the pine, sand, and birch into Lake Huron. Bonfires and frosted tailgates mark the way down the dusty path over mud ruts and maple roots. 
Old men sit smoking on rusted out tailgates, bologna sandwiches in the cooler, booze at the ready. Kids slosh through sand and clay and pint-sized hip waders that stretch to their necks. The dippers' nets shine in their headlights when the tail curves the truck toward the water. Uh, Dad steers down the campsite road that shadows the river, and Uncle Tony tooks up from the passenger side. Boys hungry, Dad tosses back a greasy paper bag with venison and butter sandwiches. Me, Johnny, Tommy, and Cousin Ryan ride back in the, the Ford's uh, wood truck bed. In most places, if I say venison sandwiches, the crowd is like, what? Everybody just sort of went with it. So. <laughs> um, Dad rigged the wood frame up and bolted it in with the metal one rusted out. It's painted blue to match the cab, but you can tell it's not a pro job. Johnny peels most of the napkin from the sandwich. My bread's all wet, he says. I take a bite and get a mouthful of napkin. Don't say a word, just spit it out. You boys wouldn't make it in the army, Dad says. He stops for a second to sip his old Milwaukee. <laughs> you don't even imagine some of the shit we ate there, right, Tony? Dad slides a rear glass window open all the way and holds out his hand. Sticks plays on the eight track. The smoky mist drifts up through the night pines. Ryan coughs. I'm sitting on the cooler, so I slide back, uh, pop the lid, and pass a couple of old Milwaukee's into uh, Uncle Tony and Dad. What's the worst thing you ate, I asked him. Bugs, rats. <laughs> Piss, says Uncle Tony. Hell, your old man even ate a shit sandwich one time, right, Gene? We ate one every day back in the bush. Dad's eyes shift back and forth from the road to the rearview mirror. Tony looks like the devil, with a red glow from the cab around his slick black hair. Smoke circles hang over his bulletproof cheeks and handlebar mustache. They must have been talking about uh, Grandpa again because they got that dead quiet look. Then Tony says, pass up, pass up a couple, three more. Going to two-fist it. It's more than five months now since Grandpa disappeared but none of us can forget what happened. Dad says he and Uncle Jack got a plane. Says they'll bring in Uncle Tony. Dad and Tony got more spare time now. Both of them laid off from the boats. Uncle old Lester Cronin's gonna get his payback. Dad and Tony were uh, rangers in the army. And I guess I forgot to mention that the, the sort of overarching conflict of the story is that <coughs> the grandfather is murdered and they know who did it, but they're not sure and they really can't do much about it, so they're waiting to find conclusive evidence so that they can get the revenge for Grandpa. But, uh, Dad and Tony don't know it, but I heard Uncle Jack, Dad's baby brother, tell Colonel Henry the Pete Girard story last night. When Dad first came back from Vietnam, he found out his sister, Aunt Karen, got pregnant. Grandma told Dad it was a rape, but not to tell Grandpa. The family was waiting for Dad to get home to take care of Pete. <laughs> That's when Tony first came up from Texas. Karen kept crying until Dad got her to tell the truth. Gerard got drunk and forced her. Karen didn't want Dad to hurt her, Pete, because he, he was her boyfriend right up to the day before, until she found out about Pete's wife in Columbus. <laughs> Dad told Hank Karen none of that mattered once Pete did what he did. Pete Gerard didn't know Dad or Tony from any other locals. His family all, always came up in the summer from Ohio since he was a kid, but the only next <coughs> thing he knew was Aunt Karen. Jack told Henry it was easy for Dad and Tony to get Pete out to the car to dip smelt. They smoked a few joints with Pete behind Cronin's hardware and sealed the deal. Jack rode out to the river with him in the back of Tony's Dodge. Says Pete was a cocky drunk. Bragged the whole trip out that he didn't have to work because he lived off his old man's money. Tire business down in Ohio. He told Jack it was gonna, he was going to trip acid when he got out to the car river. Make it all psychedelic. Pete wasn't much for fishing. Neither Jack or Pete saw it coming. Jack went to sleep around midnight and he woke up to the scream. Saw Tony toss something red into a five gallon bucket of smelt. Dad was on top of Pete, holding his right arm down, knee in the small of Pete's back. Tony was holding a bloody buck knife and, and kicking clumps of ground and dust into Pete's face. Jack heard Dad say, guess what's next? Jack walked over to Tony, asked him what was going on, saw Pete's hand in the bucket. Dad told Jack, go for a walk, you ain't seen nothing. Jack dumped the bucket. Then he saw another splash come from behind him. Nobody saw Pete Gerard around town after that. Nobody around here missed him. When Jack got done telling the Colonel Henry the story about Pete Gerard, he was all choked up, but Henry's face didn't change the whole time. All Henry did was puff a cigar and say, those are the, those are the stains of kin. Yes, sir, the behind the stains of kin. And then Jack looked at me and told me to never tell anybody that story or to kill me. The metallic blue Chevy in front of us pulls off to the left. Dad hits a rut and knocks a sandwich out of little Tommy's hand. What's it like to smoke them gooks, Johnny asks. I hope you never find out, boy, says Uncle Tony. Dad looks kind of sober all of a sudden. 
He doesn't say anything, but he's thinking hard. What was it like, I asked him, Vietnam? Different than you think, says Uncle Tony. This is one time we was walking through the jungle, middle of nowhere, and we hear this noise. It sounds like a baby, but there's nobody around, and we're humping through some hot terrain. We're thinking it's a goat, but it's a real human baby, lying there in the paddy by some plants, look like little palm trees. Sometimes over there, you might think you're in Florida or Hawaii or some damn place, but for all the bullets all around. A baby, Ryan laughs. Sounds like bullshit to me, says Johnny. You want to hear the story or not, says Tony. Platoon sergeant says that we have to leave it, keep going. Lieutenant Boyle says, don't touch it, it might be a booby trap. What kind of shit is that, strapping grenades to babies? But these VC don't mess around. Do whatever it takes. We saw the kind of crazy nobody believe, unless you were there. Tony cracks another old Milwaukee. There's nowhere good left to, to park at the river mouth, so Dad circles around back to the north side road over where the sandbar splits the river. He finds a spot. We all hop out where the tailgate should be while the four jumps and sputters dead, headlights aimed at the riverbank. Johnny and I run over to the hard sandy ledge trying to get a look at the river. It's six feet down, can't see much. The water, coffee and milk color, runs fast till it empties at St. Martin's Bay. The headlights and spotlights all around make it hard to see anything but the steel mesh and poles of the smelt nets and the current crackles loud over old men's bullshit and the CCR that winds through AM radio. The wind rips through hard every few minutes, then calms. I snatch the net away from my little brother Tommy, walk the trail down to the water and start to dip. Can't tell if Tommy's gonna cry or he's just shivering up there in his blue hood. Green and yellow snot leaks from both sides of his red nose. Everything smells like fish, cedar, and smoke. I breathe it all in and step into the muck. The carpet's flow pulls me closer, almost takes me in. Dad anchors me, must have followed me down. He pulls the collar of my ripped blue coat, steadies me on the bank. This ain't too far from, that kid dr from where that kid drowned last year, eh, Gene? Says Uncle Tony from the trail. Never found him until the next morning, one of the Lev Asseur boys, Corey. No, Cody, I say, Ronnie's little brother. Cody, we was here when it happened, eh, Gene? Took at least a good six pack for the old man figured out he was missing. Suppose you kinda expect it with a family like that. So many little bastards running around, no accountability for him. So drunk he could hardly walk, too. Wasn't long ago, one of them boys was looking to take back the net from that little Cody or Corey. Old Levi Sewer about shit himself when he saw the boy gone into that party real quick. Had us all out here, shining the river with every light west of Drummond Island, Dad says. About four in the morning, old man Jacques was down on his knees crying to God in French. It was daylight by the time that Williams boy saw the red sweatshirt hung up on a route down river, right that way. Half the town needed a jump start in the morning. I was one of them, Tony says. So caught up looking for the kid. My headlights was on all night. When the trooper come by, I told him, I told him I was good. You know me. I ain't getting no help from no pig. <laughs> Had a quarter pound in my trunk, too. <laughs> Almost got stuck out here because of it. Swaying it all out till the pork belly split. Funny thing, it was uh, Liv Asur himself would give me a jump. A rough shape that old, old guy was in. Did you see him, Uncle Tony? Johnny asked him. See who? The Liv Asur boy? Yeah, we saw the body. Kid was bloated good, only a few hours in the river, uh, right, Gene? Dad nods. He's helping Tommy and Ryan dip with the other net. Looks like they're really catching him, too. Dad shines a flashlight on the five-gallon bucket to show us. It's filling fast. You never told us what happened with the baby, Tommy says. The, gr the grenade, says Ryan. So I see it there. Muddy blanket stuck in a pile of jungle shit. Baby looked clean. Best I could tell there's no wire. Big stupid guy I am, I kneel down to it, tell the platoon uh, to clear out. Sergeant Preston says, step away from the baby. Tells me, that's an order, Vega. He's scared, knows I won't listen to him, and he backs off with the rest of them, except for your old man. Gene's down on the ground there with me, looking for the wires under the baby. I remember we looked at each other, thinking we might get blown to shit any minute. Then I picked it up, nothing, just stopped crying. Tony stares out to the dark side of the trail, into the maples. Then what happened, I say. Did he die? Who, says Tony? In the Nam, I say. It was a girl, he says. But then I got really scared. Started thinking what he was going to do with it. Couldn't just leave it there. Boyle wanted to. But he was too churchy to, to order us not to do it. I ain't responsible for that damn thing, he said. You want to get uh, shot for a little dick baby, that's your business. 
That boy was all, Boyle was all right for a college boy. Your old man rigged up some bandage strips to uh, sling the baby up on his shoulder. And that's as far as Tony gets in the story before he's got to take a, take a leak. He walks up to the tree line with the zippo and zigzags. Tomorrow's Good Friday. We got a half a day of school, but most of us won't be there. I must have seen about half the guys in my class here. Chris, Jay, Paul, a few more. It's so dark and who knows who else is out here. I already got one turn with the hip waiters. I was up there a good hour or more. The old man and I went to the shallows, but it was still up to my thighs. After a while, you really start to feel the cold in the water, even with the waders. I got my gloves and winter coat on, but there's no way to keep our clothes dry when you're half a net deep in snow. I can really feel the chill now out of the water. Dipping works up a sweat, especially when they're running good. One pull, the net was so heavy, almost took me downstream. Dad was close by again, but even as strong as he is, I wonder if he could have got me in time if I fell. Keep your head up and be your back straight, unless you want to take a dip, he says. I filled the bucket a couple times myself, the catch shining like Coors light cans in the headlights on the old, of the old Ford. When the five gallon bucket filled again, it was Johnny's turn in the waiters. So now I do the dumping. The black, three black trash bags sit almost full in the truck bed. The music's quieter now than that most of the uh, party crowd's gone. Only the serious dippers and drunks stick around this late. The slow breeze, and if you've ever gone there, you know it's true, right? <laughs> <laughs> the slow breeze in from the bay is just cold enough to frost my neck and give me the goosebumps on my arms. The spot on the river where we're at's got a tree on the other side, growing sideways up, up the bank. It swings back and forth real slow over the brown water like an old man in a rocking chair. It's not so crowded on the bank now that most of the traffic's gone. Uncle Tony's still smoking with Chester Wolf out by the maples on the other side of the road. The moonlight's bright enough now I can see their faces. They're both real serious. Probably talking about Lacey again. She left him on Christmas Day and still breaks down every time he talks about her. There's nothing like a six foot three, 250 pound Italian Mexican with a big bushy mustache, fifth pop, pop off in hand, uh, rolling around in the dirt crying like a baby in a leather Harley jacket. When it happens, about once a week or so, Dad's quick to point out that even though uh, Tony's like a brother to him, he's not blood. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy and Ryan sleep in the cab of the pickup. Their blanket is the canvas tarp strip Dad uses to cover his tools in the truck bed. Ryan's mouth is open like a smelt sucking for water. Tommy's curled up like a bear cub. The rest of the guys took a break from the river. Dad's chugging old Milwaukee with my baseball coach, Mr. Roth. They're drunk, laughing by the cooler in the back. Johnny plays catch with Roth's kid. His name's Johnny, too. They're both fifth graders, but Roth's kid's a little bit fatter. And my brother uh, Johnny's skinny like me. People always tell us we look like twins, but I'm taller, older. Colonel Henry and Grandma Clio used to come out here every year as long as I can remember. Never showed up this year, though. They're not big into dipping smelt. But they sit around the fire, drink beer, and smoke with the best of them. Last year, they got here around 1 in the morning with some hot plates full of uh, pulled pork, mashed potatoes, brown beans, and barbecue sauce. It must be 5 in the morning now, and I'm starving. The venison sandwiches and can of brown beans we had are long gone now. There's a part of me that keeps thinking that any minute, the Colonel's Lincoln is going to uh, turn down the path to find our spot on the river. Colonel uh, Henry will light a cigar, take off that beaver skin hat, and scratch his head while he tells me it is Tennessee draw to help Grandma with the food in the back seat. The dinner leftovers will warm my hands through the foil grandma wrapped around the place, and I'll feel the hot air from inside the car just before it slips out into the dark morning frost, and my face will remember what it felt like to be outside, to be not here. The only headlights we see for now are headed out to Mackinac Trail. The nice catch steams in silver piles from buckets and trash bags in the bed of Dad's truck. A few smelt flop around in small empty spaces in the back, and some are just there, frozen to the wood on the bed. I love smelt dipping, but I hate that fish stink. And smelt, and these numbers, can do some real damage to your nostrils. It's that cold, muddy fish smell that grocery store fish can't match. <laughs> the way they're piled up here, I'm not sure how we're going to get back home, all six of us, without somebody sitting on a pile of fish in the back. We really killed them tonight, and we'll be sp uh, <laughs> smelt frying for weeks. There's no good reason for me to go back down to the river, but I've got an urge to get down there one more time and feel the little scaly darts pull the net down current. Dad and Tony found a campfire ring. They're smoking by the fire, roasting a couple of smelt. Dad moves to 
the stick to different spots in the pit to keep the little silverfish from burning. All three younger boys are still sleeping in the cab of the truck, the windows fog from their snoring. They all got mud on their jackets and pants. Ryan and Tommy got their sweatshirt hoods and gloves on. Johnny's wearing Dad's camouflage Budweiser cap with the brim loose over his eyes and nose. The cap smells like smelt, sweat, and wet sand when I open the truck for another trash bag. You going back down, Dad asked me. We got enough damn smelt already, dude. Tony puffs and chokes a little bit on his joint. It's not all about the fish. No, but the fish makes it better, my old man says. Come sit down, Buck. You're old enough to hear this. I want, I want to go back down to the river, see the smelt caught in the steel mesh, and feel the cold numb of the steel handle through my brown jersey gloves. The icy water of the carp feels safer, warmer, than Tony and Dad's cold faces over the fire pit. Dad points for me to stay put, so I take my seat on a half slab of birch that'll feed the fire before dawn. Your grandpa was a good man, says Tony. Gave me work and a place to stay when we got back from the war. I'd do anything for him. Can't do anything for him now, Uncle Tony, I say. My chest dice up. He's gone. Nobody gonna bring him back now. He ain't coming back, but we sure as hell gonna do something about it, Dad says. That's my old man. You listen and listen, good boy. I don't want you telling anybody about this. Not your mother, nobody. You got me? His hazel eyes burn through my frosted soul, and all I can do is nod and look down at the roots that stick out through the last few pastures of ice. Last year, out here at the carp, the colonel got into a good with Uncle Ray about church and God, and Uncle Ray was talking about how Colonel Henry and Grandma Clio should just get married already instead of living in sin. When Ray brought it up, it made me sick to my gut. I never wanted to think about Grandma and Henry rolling around wrinkled and naked. <laughs> Why would old people want even want sex? Leave it to the young. Ray must have been thinking a lot about it, though. Brought it up a few times before the colonel told him to shut his mouth. Colonel Henry always says, ain't no bigger hypocrites than, than men like that, boy. Biggest sinners of them all. He gave old ear, uh, Ray an earful, and Ray mostly stood there shaking his head. Everybody knows Grandma Clio was a boss, but she let Henry go on him, shooting uh, Ray bad looks. Never seen Colonel Henry get so many words out without Grandma stopping him. <laughs> but she was pissed off at Ray. And Henry laid into him. It seemed like every other word was a curse, but the colonel cranks it up when he gets riled. Ray said something about blasphemy, blasphemy and the colonel told him why should he care about a, a god who let him sit there and watch three of his brothers die in a coal mine. <clears throat> what kind of deity kills children and ruins the life of a nine-year-old boy, he asked Ray. Henry and five of his brothers fell into the shaft, but only three of them made it out. Henry told us how he never went to church after that. All this is probably the reason Ray didn't come out this year. I don't know why the Colonel and Henry, uh, Colonel Henry and Grandma didn't come out though. They patched their fights over a bottle of scotch. Never take anything too personal. Wherever they are, it's got to be warmer than here. I wish I could go back and erase everything that Tony and Dad told me about their revenge plan. I wish I was one of the younger boys sleeping in the cab of the truck. Even with all the stink. Lester Cronin's got it coming, but I never wanted to be drug into killing, even if it's for Grandpa. Makes sense now why Tony's keeping such a close eye on Lester. No surprise, he's the one who's going to take him down. I'm sure it's personal too, not just about Grandpa. Tony's still sore over the walleye contest. They said old Cronin cheated, caught fish after the deadline. Nobody could prove anything, the contest being on the honor system and all, but everybody knows Lester Cronin caught almost a pound after the deadline was over. Stole second place at Tony's $150 prize. Before Lacey left, that was all Tony would talk about when he got pissed off drunk. Tony got real fume last week when mom told him what happened with Lester's uh, mother. Rumor is, Lester killed her off with decon. Needed the inheritance money so he could keep his hardware store open. Rat poisoned her every day till she croaked. Nobody in town could prove that either, but everybody knows the truth. <laughs> I zipped down my fly and, and peed by dad's front truck tire. Try to get my jeans all the way back up while I'm, I walk past the fog windows of the old Ford north of the fire, but the zipper jams and pinches my pointing finger. When I get the zipper up, I suck the blood from my finger and grab the smelt net one more time. Walk the path down the hill to the river. Don't even look up, back up to the ridge when somebody starts to, or tries to start the truck. It could be that Tony and Dad had enough and are packing up, but it might be that they're trying to keep the boys warm in the cab or to keep the battery from draining in the cold. The radio was on all night and half the morning, so it needs a good charge by now. The dim sunlight fights its way up from behind the birch and maples and paints a pink-red sky. Hard sand from the bank falls in chunks when I step in the wrong places. 
I feel drunk, but I didn't touch any alcohol this time. Not even a sniff of, of uh, Dad or Tony's beer. And I guess I should have mentioned too that this kid's like 12 years old, you know. So. <laughs> <coughs> the truck motor still won't start. It sounds like a hacksaw in rookie hands. After a few tries, somebody finally gets the engine to turn over. The eight track is blasting up on the ridge behind me. Sounds like sticks again. About three feet down, a big chunk of hard sand crumbles off the side. I try to grab the branches of the pine that grows crooked, almost sideways over the water, but it only keeps me up for a few more seconds. The tip of the tree bounces back like a slingshot, slapping me in the face. The current pushes me away from the hilltop campsite where Dad's truck is parked. I don't yell, not even with the shock of the cold water. It's not that deep, and I'm sure somebody heard the splash. I can't see anybody, just the cold red sun sunrise and the roots and trees that stick out the steep bank of the carp. I try to pull myself out, but my clothes are too heavy. The hip waders fill fast with river water, and it's all I can do to breathe, to keep my head above the dark water. The river thrashes me to a branch sticking out the right side bank, and I grab the twisted cedar with frost numb fingers. I think of Cody Levasseur's cold, white, and blue carcass. I'm stronger than him. I won't die in this river. The cold's loosening my grip, though, and the wet's prying my fingers from the branch. I hold on a good couple of minutes, then I give in and go where the river wants to take me. I fight with all the fight left in me to get back to the bank, but the water's too heavy. I paddle my arms and kick my legs with nothing left but my adrenaline. My body gives out, so I rest a few seconds and try to do it again, but all the muscle in my arms and legs is gone. I'm scared when my head goes under, but it feels kind of peaceful in a way because I'm so tired. Last summer, a couple months after Henry and Ray's big fight, Dad and old Henry got into some deep bullshitting when they were cooking burgers and brats over the dunes. Henry says he's mostly an atheist, but he could be wrong. There could be a god, nobody knows for sure. Guess that's the best anybody's got to go with. Doesn't call me much, not knowing what's next, but the river's taking me down, taking me with her, and nothing I can do can change that. My head gives way to the carp's brown current. After the boys fell asleep, Tony finished his army story. He said that him and Dad took turns carrying the baby girl, but Dad carried it more than Tony did. Don't know how we did it, Tony said, humping to 60 and all. My fat ass had a hard enough time without the baby, but I tried to pull my way too. <clears throat> he said that the baby was good luck. Not a shot was fired the three days that they carried the baby. They fed her water and coffee through a, a green nipple they rigged up out of rain gear. You would have thought it was a real uh, breast the way that that baby would suck on the thing, Tony said. We left it with a little girl, the first village we come across. Humped a good 30 miles on that, that day, and then the shit got real hot. We took three, no four, KIA in our platoon alone in a roadside ambush that day. Can you believe that, Buck, he told me? A baby right there in the middle of the jungle. A single hand rips me out of the river with a pull like a steel crane. <coughs> that kind of force has got to be Uncle Tony. All I feel is the hand and the suction of the river until the iced air stings through my soaked clothes and works its way to my head. I feel punching on my chest, steady and strong until I chunk out water. Everything feels hard and real again. Then I see the face with the hands. It's dad, not Tony. Gonna be a cold ride home, he says. I told you to keep your head up. You gotta keep your goddamn head up, boy. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, some of the things, it's hard. I probably should have explained some of the some more of the aspects of the, the book before I got into the reading, but I mean, yeah. The, <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions about anything or, or comments or, yeah? Yeah, whatever happened to that baby they found in the jungle, was, did, they ever, did they ever take it to a stage or was it still left there? Well, they said that, yeah, they left it in the village. Oh, okay. So they don't even know what happened to it? No. <laughs> that's kind of eating at me when you were Keith mentioned it, so that's why I just <laughs> They just left it there, so they don't know. What was the setting of that that chapter? What year? Uh, that was 1980. I believe it's 1983 at the Carp River. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, at that point, a lot of people had 
cassette players, they wouldn't need a, 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 an eight track tape. But there were, you'd be surprised, a lot of people still had uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> eight track players back then. That's not mine at home, it still works. That's right. <laughs> that was my grandpa's, he wanted a golf tournament the last year they made them. Yeah, the, the more durable it's always in these cassettes, right? They seem to last longer. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they were playing sticks, which was pretty good for 1983. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and I hope I wasn't overdoing it with the symbolism of it, right? But I mean, people would have been listening to you know, And actually, I remember going out and we did listen to sticks. So. Mm -hmm. And CCR. And CCR. Yeah. <laughs> Quite the combination. <laughs> right. <laughs> was your dad a Vietnam vet? No, he wasn't. Who's the model for the father in Tony? Or is there a model? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, a lot of times, and I know there are other fiction writers here too, and, and uh, we do a lot of tricky different things, right? We, we often come up with sort of composite characters, right? Where we might base it on several different people, and in some ways, you know, I did base uh, parts of the personality on my dad, but then the character does a lot of different things that my dad might do, and, and, and my dad was not a, a Vietnam uh, vet, but I knew plenty of people who were, and I would hear their stories when I was younger, and you know, so it's pretty easy to write those characters. And then. Yeah. How long did it take you to write that book, and including the research, and when did you start? And uh, well, you know, I hope that the next one doesn't take as long as this one because it was like five years, but <laughs> it took quite a while and uh, part of the reason for that was I was still kind of finding my way, I think, and um, it, it, part of it was my MFA thesis and it, it doesn't really resemble the MFA thesis anymore, but it, you know, some of the, the excerpts from here, you know, were part of my MFA thesis, but I remember my uh, thesis director telling me at the time that, you know, that don't even try to tell us that this is a novel because this does not resemble a novel in any way. You know, these are uh, <laughs> loosely related stories. And then, so I knew I had a lot of work to do after I finished the uh, MFA too. Uh, but it, yeah, all in all, it was about five years. But in, in the meantime, I mean, I've been working on a lot of other stuff too. I have a, you know, poetry manuscript and I've written other fiction that's not in the book. And, but um, I, I get sidetracked and I, you know, I've, Feel like working on one thing, and I might set something aside and then go back to the those you yeah, about five years. Yes, I've never been smelt fishing, but after listening to that, I, I could feel it and smell it <laughs> <laughs> quite a vivid. Yeah, you missed out on it this year, but maybe next year. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. see how accurate this is. Uh, hopefully, there's not so much shady business going on out there. So how did you start out? Was it a character or you knew you wanted to write about the UP or what was the, the kernel at the beginning? Uh, well, you know, I have to admit some of the uh, the chapters were more like stories, I guess, in the beginning. And then I started to see a, a connection. And then I sort of started messing with the idea that making it a longer work and, and I was convinced. Uh, you know, when I lived here, I might not have believe that the Eastern Upper Peninsula would be a great setting for fiction. And I think that a lot of times we undervalue the place that we grow up and it takes moving away to, to realize the potential of, of your uh, <laughs> of geographical area. And I think that uh, the more time I spent away from here, I started to realize that, you know, this is, it is pretty unique. And I, you know, I had people read some of the early stories and they would tell me that, you know, this is something I've never heard of before and you should write a whole book about Eastern Upper Peninsula and, and these people up there and, and uh, you know people have done it before and probably the most uh, notable example is, is uh, you know Hemingway did set some of his stories up here right and, and I remember reading those and I think that it was uh, in a way kind of inspirational to, to have someone write about this area to think it was important enough to, to write about it but as time went on as I've said to people in interviews before I developed a sort of uh, love-hate relationship with Hemingway, you know, and I, and I wanted to try to do it better than Hemingway did because I felt like he didn't really get the area the way that a local would, you know. And so I wanted to bring in a more local perspective, and that's why I bring in these, you know, sort of working-class characters, people who who spend the entire uh, year here, not people who just come to summer here and enjoy the the, the fun, you know. That's great too, right? But it's it's a whole different story when you have to spend the, the winter here, right? And <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to bring some of that in, and so I intentionally left out a lot of the. Uh, you know, you'll find that you know most of the seasons of the year are, are, is winter, fall, some spring, right? But very little summer, and the summer that you do see is sort of backstories, kind of reminiscing on things, yeah. And, and uh, so, you know, I wanted to try to do that, and I've I've already heard from a couple of people, which you know, I thought it might be the case that, well, you, 
you know, some of the characters kind of make local people look bad, and, and uh, <laughs> you don't have to, to claim them. But I, I guarantee if you've lived here long enough, you know somebody like the people in the book, right? Yeah. They may even be in your own family, whether or not you want to admit it, right? But uh, I will. I'll say that, you know, I've known plenty of people like this. So. Um, other questions or comments? You ever thought of all of, you know, uh, uh, writing another book, follow book? Real <laughs> I mean, this, a lot of people want to see that. They told me I'd like to see some sort of a sequel, but I think it would be really difficult because I think I, I could really ruin it if I, if I don't do it yeah. the right way. I, um, I mean, it ends just right, so it's kind of hard to. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to, to top that. I guess it would, it would be uh, disappointing for some people if, if the, I think it's better not knowing what happens to them in some ways, right? But I was thinking about bringing him back as a character with with. Uh, you know, maybe using some of the other characters from the book and then making him a minor character in other stories. And and, uh, and I also wanted to go back in the past and maybe do a, a story of uh, Henry when he's younger. And so, but yeah, I, I don't know about a, a sequel. I think that would be, I don't know if I can pull it off. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the character is uh, compelling enough that you want to know what's going to happen to him afterwards. I mean, it's just, it's been a big deal here. It's just not true. Right. <laughs> you left them in the hotel room, Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I've had people tell me that they're frustrated about that. You know, so what happens to what happens to them? Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's yeah. Is all of is most of the fiction that you write set in the Eastern Upper Peninsula? Do you find that, or do you skip around a lot, or um, how long have you been in Texas, and when did you start writing about the EP? I've been down there for over 10 years now okay. and I guess the, yeah the longer that I spent down there it was probably about five years ago that I started writing more about this place and before that I would set a lot of my fiction in other places and mm -hmm. um, lately I would say probably two-thirds of what I write fiction wise is, is set up here uh, but I was kind of thinking about bringing in a couple of characters you know one from this book and uh, maybe Combining the, the place where I live now, because it's kind of interesting there too, on the, on the Mexico-U.S. border, uh, having some stories in Mexico and having them, you know, uh, tell kind of backstories about things that happened up here, but they're down, you know, on the border and maybe going into Mexico, and, and so I've done a little bit of that writing about uh, places in Mexico too lately. Other. Do you find the vein is rich when you try to go to Mexico, or do you find the vein up here a lot richer because it's your experience? I think that, that both are rich. I think that maybe part of the problem with uh, you know writing about down there is, is that I'm a transplant though too, and then you know you wonder you know I, I would want to do it right if I do it, and I want it to, to feel authentic for people who are living there too. Uh, it, because you know, with fiction, I do try to bring in a, a sense of place that's important. Because a lot of the, the fiction writers I like, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm trying to be some sort of a you know local color writer, but I do want to give the readers a sensory experience and, and, and bring them to the place where the story is uh, occurring. And, and uh, you know, so it's probably easier to, to achieve a sort of authenticity, and it probably comes faster when I write about here. And then down there, I struggle a little bit more with with different things and. Well, you know, I mean, does the EUP, I mean, after you can step away from it, doesn't, don't you find that it, it kind of does have its own kind of attitude and its sense, okay. right? So yeah. <laughs> it's hard to think like a, you know, it's hard to, yeah, the Mexican thing's a whole different, yeah. different bag, you know. I mean, yeah, it is. There's not, I'm sure there's a lot that's similar, but similar in its own, yeah. in its own way. And uh, you know there are quite a few Canadians uh, from Ontario and, and people from Southern Michigan working in some of the the maquilas and the, the other businesses down there, and even they you know they, they talk about the distinctness of the, the Uber you know from like oh that's a whole other group of people they're really crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like that person from Michigan. That's you know. <laughs> um, other. Questions or comments? Okay. Working on anything? Yeah, I'm working. I'm trying to decide on uh, what to do first because I do have almost a, a completed poetry manuscript, and I have a couple of other novels that I started working on. And 
I haven't been able to focus on, on just one thing. I've been working a little bit on everything, and it's it's kind of distracting me. I guess I should focus on one thing and just do other things. But I have a couple other novels that I started on, and some stories here and there that may not be part of a novel. But are you here for the summer? I'm here uh, through the Fourth of July, and then I have to go back and, and go to work. I'm still the department chair for another summer semester. I couldn't get out of it. I tried, but. Pay your dues. I had uh, somebody covering for me for the first summer semester, so I came up here. But um, yeah, the, uh, you know, the guy he didn't want to. That was one of the stipulations. He, he needed to uh, have until the fall to get ready to, to take over. So. And of course, the, the, the woman who was going to take over for me initially, she got pregnant, and then. Uh, that was her, I could tell she was really happy that she didn't have to do it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she said that, well, uh, you know, somebody asked afterward about um, her doing it after the baby is born and, and, you know, maybe a year too old, if she might come back and do it. And, and I said that we never thought to ask that at the time, but, you know, it was kind of too late now. And she says that she wants nothing to do with the chair, chip, so. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully there'll be some more writing time. I know that I'm interrupted quite a bit with the chair business. So. So anything else? Any other questions? Did you bring any poetry you could read? You know, I, I didn't bring any with me, and I wish that I could just recite it by memory, but I can't. Can we read it online? I have a few things here and there, and I have one little one that, with all of with some of you right on the, the way north too. A little poem about Taquamanon, and, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the more recent poetry publications, but I've been so focused on the fiction lately that I haven't done as much with it, but I, yeah, I do want to go back and just, uh, you know, uh, finish that poetry manuscript too, but all the fiction writers tell me, like, well, why bother, right, because, you know, the, <laughs> we, we make jokes that the, a lot of times we go to poetry readings that there are more poets than there are spectators. <laughs> <laughs> And I wish that was a joke, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I mean, that was my first uh, love, right? You know, I started writing poetry when I was a, just a little kid. I don't remember when exactly, but you know, I, I was writing poetry before fiction even. And I worked uh, quite a bit with Dr. Gazinski here. He certainly helped me improve in that area. So other, other questions? Anything else? Well, thank you very much. Oh, is there a question? Okay, yeah, go, yeah, go. Yeah. Well, you, you talk about writing two or three different things at once. Right. Do they feed each other, or do they, you talk about distraction, but maybe that's just the way your brain works. <laughs> yeah, it is sort of the way my brain works, I think. <laughs> I don't know if it's, if it's a, the most efficient way to work. I, I don't know, maybe sometimes, <laughs> you know, one thing could feed off another, and I've got good advice from people. I, I uh, you know, one thing is I end up having to write a lot of reviews, like, many writers do of other books and because of my editorial responsibilities in different places I have to to write essays and reviews and they say a lot of times that you uh, you know sit down to, to write a review that you know you sort of get fed up with writing the review or, or the, the sort of tedium that goes along with it and then it inspires you to, to write more creative stuff and that's worked for me a few times so. <laughs> I got some uh, good news just two days ago too, and I was really glad to be in the EUP when I got it. But apparently, uh, some big French editors have been reading it, and there's a, a big uh, publishing house in Paris that wants to. They started translating it and they want to publish it in France. So, wow. I'm really excited about that. Thank you. Next thing we'll have French tourists here trying to check us out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I hope so. Yeah, it's pretty funny that you know, a lot of my colleagues and other people I've met, at, you know, doing different readings, uh, they seem to be really interested in the EUP once I'm done uh, reading, or, or if they've read the book, you know, they want to come and see what it's like here. And I had two colleagues come up just a few days ago, and, and they said, "Yeah, you weren't exaggerating." It, you know, it really <laughs> <laughs> Where did you take them? Oh, we went. Uh, we came up here and we went to Taquamanon and we just sort of did a, a few sites around here and and, uh, and then one of my friends said, you can see that, you know why I'm so influenced by Emerson too and the transcendental writers and the, you know, that I, that how, you know, how could you grow up in a place like this and not <laughs> like Emerson? I say, how can you uh, be a lover of aphorism and not like Emerson? So. <laughs> 
So is that it or anything else? Thanks very much. Thank you. This is uh, great. I appreciate it. It's really great to see everybody and, and yeah. meet new friends and, and see old friends and family. And Thank you. This is great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.